Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park and have been made possible in part by Ravinia Festival, CJE Senior Life, GAND Music and Sound. Hi, I'm Joyce Bernstein. I'm a member of the Senior uh, Highland Park Producers, and today I have a brilliant and distinguished guest, Roberta R. Qual. That's K-W-A-L-L, -L, and she's known to many as Bobby, so we'll call her Bobby. Bobby is currently a professor of law at DePaul University co-director of the Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies and director of the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Informational Technology. She is originally from New Jersey, but is a Highland Park resident. She earned her JD from the University of Pennsylvania and her AB Magna Cum Laude from, from Brown University. She has written 34 scholarly papers and several books including um, The Soul of Creativity, and um, she has uh, received numerous awards, and in 2006 was named as one of the 10 best lawyers in the state of Illinois. Law professors. Law, law, law professors, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, hi Bobby, how are hi, you? Hi Joyce, thank you so much for having me. This oh, is an honor a and a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And, um, well, let's start with um, your Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies. Um, you co-direct this. And now, DePaul is a Catholic school, so how did the center come about? DePaul is indeed a Catholic school. Um, not only are we Catholic, DePaul um, endorses what is known as the Vincentian Mission. We are a Catholic school of the Vincentian Order. Oh. So, um, and, and we are the largest, I believe DePaul is the largest um, private um, university uh, in, in the country, so, so I recall. Anyway, um, about, uh, we are now in our sixth year. The Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies is now starting its sixth year. Um, when we first started the center, my co-director and I thought it would be a good time to start um, putting DePaul in a very positive light um, in the news. Mm -hmm. um, we had had, prior to that, um, some situations involving uh, a one-time um, professor named Norman Finkelstein who had created quite a furor, oh. uh, not a positive one, in, oh, in the Jewish community. Um, the president of DePaul um, actually confirmed uh, a tenure denial, um, and it, it was an unfortunate um, it was a lot of negative, you know, mm -hmm. publicity within the Jewish community, although ultimately, again, the, the result was one that oh. the Jewish community was oh. in favor of. But, you know, there, there was that situation. There's, you know, some other political issues that, that are very prevalent now on college campuses, not just DePaul. Mm -hmm. And so we thought the time might be right to showcase DePaul in a positive light mm -hmm. for the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, my co-director and I um, have been colleagues at that point for close to 20 years. We're both longtime veteran faculty members. And we thought it might be a good opportunity to really um, do something very positive, not just for the law school, um, mm -hmm. but also for the Jewish community. Um, and when we started, um, it, was, it was actually very sweet. We went to um, visit the president of the university, Father Holschneider, who mm -hmm. of course is a, is a priest. And, and he said that he loved what we were doing. Oh, um, he was very supportive of it. Um, and he actually uh, said to us that DePaul was started, uh, the university, was started as a place where both Catholics and Jews 
could go to school oh. because there was a very rigid quota system in oh. place. Mm -hmm. and this was true certainly at the law school level. And so uh, DePaul was started for that purpose. And so he was really excited oh, about the fact that we now have this mission uh, and this Center for Jewish Law and Judaic Studies. Yeah, I attended DePaul, but in the undergraduate division. Right, uh -huh. right. A lot of, lot of Jewish uh -huh. alums are. I studied are. a lot of philosophy and theology. It was quite different than other uh, schools like University of Illinois. And, sure. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah, I liked going there too. So um, what makes your center particularly unique? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, th there's a number of things that makes our center unique. First of all, just having a Jewish law center, mm -hmm. let alone one in a Catholic university. Oh, but right. just having a Jewish law center in a law school is unique. Yes. There are very few schools, I think maybe under five law schools that have Jewish law in centers. In the United States or in worldwide? The, in the United States. Oh, okay. Um, in the United States. So mm -hmm. we are one of a very, very small handful. And I, I believe we are probably the only Catholic um, law school to oh, have a Jewish law yeah. center. And we are also the only Jewish law center in the Midwest. Oh. Uh, there's a couple of uh, schools with Jewish law centers in New York. I was going to say probably yes. New York. And a couple on the coast, mm -hmm. on the West Coast. But we mm -hmm. are the only one in the Midwest. So that in and of itself um, makes for a very unique um, Correct, situation. Yeah. Um, I, I also think that the the partnership that I have with my co-director is unique. Um, my my co-director is a, a balshuv, meaning he's uh, was not raised uh, religious necessarily. Oh. He was actually oh. um, he actually you know was raised with religion, but he wasn't Orthodox. He didn't mm -hmm. grow up Orthodox. And um, shortly around the time he uh, was in law school, or shortly after he graduated from law school, um, he he actually became more and more interested in serious observance. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, he he studied in a yeshiva in Lakewood. Uh, he was ordained. He's a brilliant brilliant mm -hmm. uh, gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the the interesting part about this is that we co-direct a center. Mm -hmm. uh, he is visibly orthodox. You know, he wears black and white white and mm -hmm. has a long beard um, mm -hmm. and you know is is certainly identified and affiliated mm -hmm. with a, a centrist orthodox community and here I am as a, um, a, cons a firm conservative Jew, mm -hmm. let's, let's leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I don't cover my hair. I don't, you know, adhere to quite the same um, uh, types of observances that, that, that he does or, or that is even within mainstream orthodoxy, as you all know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have this very interesting partnership. But there's actually a little bit more to the, our story, which is actually pretty unbelievable. Um, very soon after we started the center, I believe it was in the first first few months. Um, my mother-in-law had passed away in 2004, mm -hmm. and I believe around the time we started the center, which was again now six years ago, um, my sister-in-law had been going through some papers of hers, and uh, of my mother-in-law's, mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. found a paper that had been written about her husband, my father-in-law, mm -hmm. whom I'd never met. Oh. I'd never met my father-in-law. He died before Jeff and I actually yeah. even met is one Jeff another. Is Jeff an attorney? Jeff is also a law professor. A law also professor, at, a, at the other Catholic, the other Catholic uh, law Loyola. school in Chicago. Oh, oh, <laughs> exactly. Okay. You take so, care of it all. Yeah, right? we, got, we got the whole Catholic Margaret Porter <laughs> <laughs> in the Qual family. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so my sister-in-law had found this letter. And the letter had been written about my father-in-law, Jeff's dad. Mm -hmm. um, and the letter was about, uh, it was written by the head of a yeshiva in Suwalk, Lithuania, where my oh. father-in-law had been born oh, and had lived. Oh, that's where my grandparents were from also. From Lithuania? Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Asha Chuck, one of them. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so lots of lit box, right, yeah, among yeah. them. So this letter um, was praising my father-in-law and saying what a wonderful uh, rabbinic student he is and how he'll make a wonderful rabbi. He was a real tzaddik, righteous person, from mm -hmm, what I had mm -hmm. known of him, from what everyone's mm -hmm. told me. And, and the letter was signed by the head of the Rosh Yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva in Suwak, Lithuania. So I thought this is pretty cool. And they got it translated. It was written in Yiddish, I believe. But my sister-in-law mm -hmm. or a relative on my husband's side had gotten it translated into English. Mm -hmm. So I, Jeff sent me, my husband sent me the translation. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. I'm going to just email it to my co-director oh, so he can see oh. I have some 
Bad pedigree, friend. right? <laughs> yeah, Even though right. by marriage, right? Yeah, yeah. But, right. You know, so I, I sent it off to to Steve. That you're kosher. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that I'm kosher, right? <laughs> so I sent it off to to Steve Rosnikoff, my co-director, mm -hmm. and within a half hour, um, he actually called me at home. Oh. And I remember this very very well. And he said, Bobby, I can't believe this. Oh. And I said. What? And I thought he was actually talking about some little political situation that was going on mm -hmm. at our law school at the mm -hmm. time. And I, I think I said to him, oh, yeah, I know. Can you believe? And he goes, no, 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 no. You don't know what I'm talking about. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, the letter, the letter you emailed me. I said, oh, yeah, that's really cool. The yeah. Rosh Yeshiva wrote that about my father-in-law. Yeah. I never met him. Yeah. He goes, you don't understand. The Rosh Yeshiva was my great-grandfather. Oh, oh, isn't that something? It was, so Small it's one of those world, meant to be, say. yes, or as we say, beshert in Beshert, the Ashkenazic right. tradition, or meant to be, or what have you. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so we, it, it was really interesting. It's a totally true story. Um, oh. He had never known that. We had never made that connection. It was just very, oh, very interesting. Oh, right, right. So, um, so yeah, so we, this, was, um, this was seven, the six years ago. And we are now, as I said, we're going into our sixth year. And, and we have several goals. A lot of people say, well, what does a Jewish law center do? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the question that we oftentimes hear is, well, what is Jewish law? You yes, know, what does Jewish yes. law have to do with anything that you yeah, possibly are doing? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think maybe let's, it, it's good to maybe take a step back and just, just talk about in very general terms how, what Jewish law is and mm -hmm. why we're talking about it in a law school. Right, right. Um, and then we'll talk, we can talk about some of the goals of the centers. Yes, and, yes some of the programs that we have done and are going to do. So Jewish law, you know, what a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily understand about Jewish law is that it is a very all-encompassing system of law that governs every aspect of human behavior, including the order in which you should tie, put on and tie your shoes. Mm -hmm. I, did you know, I didn't know that until no, I did some research. No, Jewish no, law actually has something to say about the order in which you put your shoes on oh, and tie so, them. Oh, so difficult. Like, right. And, I and, mean, to somebody that's not familiar with it. Exactly. It covers mm -hmm. everything. I mm -hmm. mean, it covers, I mean, most people think of, okay, it covers Shabbat and yeah, yeah, kosher. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, actually right on Saturday. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's actually so much more extensive. I know. I have that. relatives that have converted to very orthodox. Her right. husband left her. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Oh, well. That's and so, problem. yeah, so you know that it really mm. covers a very broad, yeah. it covers really, I, I think it's fair to say that Jewish law covers every aspect of human behavior. Yes. So at this point in time, you know, people are very interested in questions um, such as what does Jewish law have to say about appropriate business ethics? Mm -hmm. What does Jewish law have to say about um, medical ethics? What right. does Jewish law have to say about war um, and tragic choices within Jewish law? Mm -hmm. You know, can you separate conjoined twins? My co-director is actually working on a book on these and particular what's issues. what's the answer to that? Well, you got to have my co-director. Oh, okay, can tell you, okay. right? <laughs> so, okay. Um, so Jew people are now really interested in, um, in what Jewish law has to say. And so one of the goals of our center is to educate both Jews as well as non-Jews, right, quite honestly, right. as to what is the genius, the continued relevance of, of Jewish ethics and Jewish law, and how does this wonderful tradition apply to the issues we face in contemporary times mm -hmm. that face all people, you know, not necessarily just Jews. A lot of people want to know what is the Jewish law position. Yeah, a lot of young people are becoming religious now. Absolutely. There's I know, I'm invited to a wedding in Beverly Hills, California in August, and this couple, my friend's grandson, is very, very orthodox, and nobody else in the family is. He just went to Israel once and came back, and that's what he wanted, and he's marrying this Jewish girl from Costa Rica, actually. Wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to be such a uh, orthodox wedding, you know. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and I think you've really hit upon um, really what I see as the second and a very important part of our goal mm -hmm. uh, as a center, and I think your story about the, the wedding mm -hmm. um, that you're describing really um, hits upon this. Mm -hmm. You know, we are in such a you know, integrated society mm -hmm. um, today, both Jewishly as well as certainly, mm -hmm. um, you know, apart from just the Jews, where everybody is mixing. It's not, you oh, know, we are yeah. not in clavis. We do not have just, you know, segments of Orthodox Jews, segments of conservative mm -hmm. Jews, mm -hmm. segments of Reformed Jews, because people are constantly, 
you know, intermixing with one another. And that story that you just told, Joyce, is not an uncommon story. Oh, really? People yeah. constantly, I'm hearing constantly stories about, um, you know, my, my son or daughter married someone really religious, uh -huh. or sometimes it happens the other way. Well, and both, so both of them were religious before they met. Actually. Exactly. But, but the families are not. But, yeah, the, but the his family are is not. Definitely not. So I think it's so critical, mm -hmm. so critical for there to be more opportunities mm -hmm. and more venues to bring Jews from different backgrounds mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And that's really a second very important goal mm -hmm. of our center. If, mm -hmm. if, if you come to some of our programs, you will see lots of men wearing kippot, uh, skull caps. Mm -hmm. You will sometimes see uh, women you know, dressed in longer dresses and completely covered with shadles. And you will see that all the way to you know jeans and t-shirts and people that you know are clearly not uh, religious. And sometimes we get you know sometimes we get people that come to our programs that are not even Jewish. Mm -hmm. And so we really have mm -hmm. a very broad um, spectrum mm -hmm. of people that attend our programs, and that's intentional on our part because oh. we really want to bring uh, people. Um, from different backgrounds in the Jewish community together to talk to one another, to dialogue with one mm -hmm. another. Because as you know, if you know people um, from different backgrounds, it's, it begins to shatter your stereotypes and you can begin to have more meaningful dialogue and respect and appreciation for one another, which I at least feel is a very, very important part of, of what we try to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the young people want to have a lot of children, they often do, and that's good. There will be more Jewish people because nowadays they have one or two children, um, people that aren't that religious, many of them, and uh, so much intermarriage. I think it's good that they'll be uh, pop. I don't know if that's the right word. Sure. Populating with more children. Like. Sure, sure. And, and I think, again, here, Joyce, you've hit upon um, what what I'm really researching now and writing about now, um, which is really the salient question. You know, we know that that orthodoxy is growing. Mm -hmm. We know that the birth and this is true both in the United States as well as in Israel. The birth rates are high. Yes. Um, and and I think the challenge. Um, I mean, it, there's a number of challenges, but mm -hmm. the, but the but the challenge that I think you've hit upon, which is an important challenge for the Jewish community generally, is you know how do you forge meaningful Jewish identity outside of the Orthodox community because mm -hmm. the majority of Jews, you know, even now, mm -hmm. both here and in Israel, are mm -hmm. not Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet, um, and yet, if you think about um, questions involving Jewish continuity, if you think about questions involving Jewish peoplehood, which are really the terms that are being used in the discourse today, mm -hmm. when you talk about the Jewish community as peoplehood that, that people are talking about, we still have to you know, figure out that path between the law part, the observance part, and, and how that gets integrated in a way that, that non-Orthodox Jews who do not see all the commandments as necessarily binding mm -hmm. and incumbent on them can still be linked to the tradition. How do you forge that identity? Mm -hmm. It's a difficult, difficult question. Mm -hmm. People are writing about it from an academic standpoint. Mm -hmm. People are trying to implement on the ground various initiatives to, to try to um, face that issue. And actually, our center is doing a program up here in the suburbs on yeah, October twenty second, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to it's called forging Jewish identity in oh. the me generation. Oh. This is the millennial oh. generation that oh. it's, that we're going to be talking about, um, and we're going to look at rabbinic perspectives, institutional perspectives, and parental ex per perspectives mm -hmm. because this generation is also very different yes, from their predecessors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Um, there's not that many Jewish people left in Europe, probably, are there? Most people are probably The here majority now. of Jews, um, I, I think Israel has the largest number yes. of Jews, um, and the second larger, largest number of Jews um, in the di diaspora is certainly in the United States. Yes. Um, and of course, there are pockets of Jews you know, throughout the world, yeah. as, as we all very well know, but the numbers are definitely... Um, the de the, there, there is decline. I mean, we know yes, that. Yes. You know, there's not just assimilation uh -huh. and intermarriage. Uh -huh. um, there's, there's a number of factors that contribute toward um, a, de a declining population. Of course, you know, not I the least of I sometimes think uh, instead of uh, terrorists getting rid of Jews, the Jews will get rid of their 
I, own selves by the, all the intermarriage. And the intermarriage, and, and I would say also, you know, the strife between the denominations it is, oh, is another yes, thing that's yes. problematic. In fact, on intermarriage, it's usually the person converting is a very strong, uh, if they're turned Well, by intermarriage, I mean, there's yeah. two ways to look. You can say intermarriage between one denomination oh, and yes, another, yes. right? But then there's intermarriage between Jews, you know, and non-Jews. Yeah, that's and, what I was speaking right. about. Yeah. Which, and the, and the rate is about 50%, the yeah, statistics show. Yeah, but often the person that converted it has become very religious. If there is a conversion, right? Yes, if there right. is a conversion. Right, and if there's Correct. a conversion, of course, it's not really an intermarriage if there's a conversion no, prior true. to marriage. No, that's true, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, legally. Legally, right, right. <laughs> okay. Um, did you uh, want to speak about your book? Or your well, books? I'm writing, um, the, the book that uh, I published in 2010 with Stanford University called The Soul of Creativity mm -hmm. um, was a book that actually, it, it's, it's interesting because that book um, in some ways led me to the present research that I'm doing now mm -hmm. on Jewish law. Mm -hmm. So that book, The Soul of Creativity, um, is really a book that looks at um, how much can a, a work of authorship, um, a poem, a book, music, dance, art, literature, anything that's protected by copyright law, oh. how much can that work be changed by someone other than the author oh. and still be considered that person's work? I mm -hmm. mean, in lay person's mm -hmm. terms, that's really the issue that I was looking at. Oh. And in the course of writing that book, I did a lot of work on what motivates human creativity, and I looked at the Jewish tradition in particular, along with the Christian tradition. I looked at what artists are saying about what motivates their own personal creativity, and I did a lot of work on why people create, and, and how people create, and what motivates them to create. Mm -hmm. Um, but that may sound, well, how do you get from there to Jewish law? Because it mm -hmm. doesn't, the, 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 there's not an intrinsic connection mm -hmm, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But in the course of thinking about what motivates artistic creativity and how we protect the voice of the author in his or her uh, creative work, I started thinking about the Jewish tradition, which, as we've just discussed before, is really composed of this. Uh, a very part of it is very legal, part of it is really narrative and not legal, but it's this wonderful tradition. And I started thinking about how much of the Jewish tradition can be changed, can be modernized, mm -hmm. and yet still be considered the Jewish tradition. Oh. And so when I thought about it, I realized that the issues I was looking at from the standpoint of copyright law mm -hmm. in the soul of creativity were not all that different oh, from what I was going really? to be looking at oh. um, in my next book, which mm -hmm. is which is actually called um, Authenticity of the Chosen, oh. um, A Look at Jewish Law and Culture. That's mm -hmm. at least the working title. Mm -hmm. And when will that book be ready? Oh, uh, God willing, that book will be, uh, <laughs> I, I just wrote to my editor this morning. I'm, I'd like the to- It's Stanford Press? This is Oxford. The second oh, book is Oxford. with Oxford. Oh, the other one was Stanford, right. correct. Yeah. I hope to submit the draft to them um, a year from now, give mm -hmm. or take, oh. and I believe Oxford takes maybe six months to get it into print. So we're looking at a year and a half, two oh, years perhaps oh. from now. If all goes well, you know, yeah, you yeah. never quite know. How do you have time for everything? <laughs> I, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I love writing, so to yes. me, that's pure joy. I'm up very early. I, you've probably received a few of my 5.30, 6 o'clock a.m. emails over oh, the course I'm of... Oh, I'm still up from the night before. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm just the opposite. So, right, so you're a night person, Yes, right? Exactly. Right, exactly, exactly. I don't like to even plan things in the morning. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. No, I love, you know, I love getting my cup of coffee. It's the first thing I do. Oh. I get my cup of coffee, and, and then I'm on email. So, it's, oh. yeah, so, you know, I like to get a lot of work done in the morning when... Yeah, well, Actually, the mind is clearer. Yeah, I think, I think, think morning. that's absolutely. Yeah, when I've had to get a, do had appointments or something early, I was happy because it makes the day so much longer. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And usually, I don't mean sleep late anyway, but just I just not ready to go to bed yet. Right. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so. And um, so, uh, you, you yourself are you Orthodox or? Um, I, one of my friends who is Orthodox jokingly called me from conservative, from oh, being from. the term that we use for very you yeah, know, Orthodox know. people. No, I'm not Orthodox. I mean, I honestly, I, I, I think like a conservative Jew. Oh. By that I mean the way conservative lawmaking takes place, oh. um, you know, which, which is a little bit more looking at 
what's called extra legal factors. By that I mean you don't, conservative lawmaking doesn't just stick to the primary sources, the rabbinic sources. It, it does tend to go outside those sources uh -huh. from time to time and depending on the issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more complicated, of course, than I'm making it right. at this point. But I tend to think about law more like a conservative Jew. Oh. But I'm observant. You know, I, I walked to Shul, as, oh, as you may you know. Yeah, I, we moved, to, no, we moved to Highland Park a oh, year ago, and oh, we moved really? there so oh. I could walk. <laughs> that oh. was, that I was the whole point. I visited my cousin, who was like a born-again Orthodox, or whatever you want to call yeah. her. She walks four miles. Wow. At, in Silver Spring. So when I stayed there, we just stayed at her daughter's in Baltimore. I, was, I couldn't walk four miles yeah. each four miles way. is a lot. I I it would be very hard. Plus, you're dressed up, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's difficult. So. Yeah. Oh, I um, think so. I know yeah. for a while I attended three synagogues at the same time, the Chabad, who, um, and uh, that's an Orthodox. Sure, sure. And, and North Suburban Synagogue Bethel, conservative, and then uh, the, um, not B'nai Tara, but the rabbi that used to be there, he opened his own, uh, Rabbi Magadavich. He has since oh, sure. given up the rabbinic life and become a builder or developer in Israel. Oh, wow. His whole family <laughs> moved there. But anyway, I prefer the conservative. I've always been, I mean, I feel most comfortable and I try to go to that. Well, I mean, Mostly. listen, everybody, I, I think, again, part of, of my thinking about the denominations, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it in the course of researching the book. I've been writing this this second book for mm -hmm. about four years, so it's mm -hmm. been a long, long time. Oh, right. um, And part of my thinking about it is just really, I've, I've really come to the conclusion that, um, you know, it, it, People are different. People are going to, and there is oh. no one size fits all. Oh, I Not know. for something as personal as religion, uh -huh. but at a certain point, I do feel strongly about Jewish peoplehood, and I do feel strongly about um, people. I think the 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 most difficult. Um, challenge we have are not the people that are affiliated with Reform, Conservative, Orthodox. Mm -hmm, it's the people mm -hmm. who are not affiliated, oh, who are right. apathetic and they don't care and yeah, they don't want least, to be affiliated. At least um, you're doing something, you know, following it some way. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, just like at one of the uh, synagogues, the Chabad people drive there. The rabbi would rather have them come than not come right, at all. Right, right, mm. of course. Not everybody, but I mean not some every, people right, do. Right, right. They the, live in other suburbs even, you know, sure. such a long walk. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, okay. and um, there aren't many, isn't Bethel the only uh, conservative temple in Highland Park? That's, That's a really good heard. question. Well, I'm a new okay. Highland Park resident oh, myself, you know, but yeah. I believe, I believe you're correct about yeah, that. I believe amazing. Bethel. Yeah. And there's North a suburban. lot of reform. There's, there's several reform. Well, there's, least, of course, yeah. It's good that I know parents weren't religious and now their children are going to these Sunday schools and Hebrew schools. Absolutely. And that's very good, I think. So now the parents have gotten more into it also. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, they say a child shall lead you, right? Yes. And that's yes, that's yes, great yes, when that, they that's really absolutely do. great when They're that so happens. so brilliant, the children, between yeah. computers and everything Sure. Else. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. You got a lot to keep up with, right? Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, so, um, are you off now from DePaul this summer? Or? I'm off for the summer. Um, off meaning I'm writing at I home. Mean, and, I mean, and there's not classes. We, we don't have classes. Oh, okay. So, actually, we don't have classes. So, okay. um, we, we resume our classes um, at the, toward the end of August. And that, is that the uh, school at uh, Fullerton or downtown? No, th that's a good question. The, the rest of DePaul is on a quarter system. Mm -hmm. I don't know when they resume. I believe it's after the law school. But the law school begins um, around the 26th of August, somewhere mm -hmm. At, at the downtown location? We're in the loop, yeah. The law yeah. school's in the loop. When I went at night, I would go downtown. To the loop, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yes. there are some. Some of the, the commerce mm -hmm. class, um, the commerce school is in the loop. I think there's a couple of other classes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. schools that meet in the loop. I know New they've learning. moved a few times since I went, but uh, right. I I don't know. Are they a Jackson book? Yes, yeah. yes, oh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, we are still at Jackson Street Street yep. years and years ago. Yep. Okay, well, our time is up. I can't believe it. I, I mean, it has just flown. It's been so interesting speaking Thank with you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and I don't know how you can hold all that information. You're so small in the statue. <laughs> I mean, in I'm size. sitting down so people can't see. <laughs>